Alexander Hamilton taps George Washington on the shoulder and says, excuse me, but we're a bit short of cash. And Washington says, well, he says, well, that war cost us a lot, you know, and we've got to, like, get some money back to the people we uh, borrowed it from. What we're going to do? Actually, it was Hamilton that came up with the answer. It's, let's tax distilled spirits. On March 3rd, 1791, the United States government taxes the production and sale of distilled spirits. And, of course, the immediate response to taxation is you go out into the woods to avoid detection and you distill by the light of the moon. The American moonshiner is born. It is in western Pennsylvania where these illicit distillers are predominant. They are mainly Scotch-Irish farmers who use their whiskey as liquid currency for trade. Years before, many of the Scotch-Irish fled unfair taxes on whiskey in their native land. Now, faced with new American taxes, they rebel. They rebelled for a darn good reason. They rebelled because they didn't have the money to pay those taxes. Whiskey was their form of currency. Whiskey was how they paid the rent. Whiskey was how they bought a new frock for their wife. Whiskey was how they bought food. And so they didn't have the money. You can't tax us because we don't have any cash. I'm sorry, give you a gallon of whiskey if you want it, but no cash. Washington says, no, I need money. In the summer of 1794, the violence escalates. Nearly 5,000 moonshiners march on Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. President George Washington calls out the militia. Washington's big worry was that the troops would not muster. And if the troops did not muster, he has lost his leadership ability and he will be seen as a failure as a president. It's a very big moment in American history and it's a war against moonshiners. Heeding Washington's call, 13,000 troops arrive in Pittsburgh to quell the uprising. Severely outnumbered and outgunned, the moonshiners hastily retreat and the Whiskey Rebellion is put down with virtually no bloodshed. But many die-hard moonshiners refuse to concede. Their hatred for taxes drives many of them to America's unsettled backwoods to ply their illicit trade. Quite a few of the Scots-Irish went down and made more moonshine in Kentucky. It had already been pinpointed as one of the most beautiful places on earth with its blue grass and its limestone water. Everybody said, maybe we'll go to Kentucky, get away without paying taxes again for a few years until they tighten up down there. The moonshiners' age-old traditions immediately take root. The southern backwoods becomes and will remain the moonshine capital of America. Since its discovery around 5000 BC, alcohol has stirred controversy. Moral crusaders consider it evil, and throughout history they try to temper its use, or ban it outright. But just as with taxes, the prohibition of alcohol only provides a strong catalyst for moonshining. One of the first major prohibition experiments in the New World occurs as settlers begin building the colony of Georgia. Original founder James Oglethorpe bans rum and brandy from the fledgling colony in 1733. 
yet Georgia is far from dry. Settlers quickly construct illegal stills and smuggle rum by boat from neighboring colonies. They trade their illegal liquor secretly, sometimes hiding the contraband in their clothing or their boots. A person who sells illegal liquor is known as a bootlegger. Georgia is soon overwhelmed with rum runners, moonshiners, and bootleggers, and the ban on alcohol ends after only nine years. The lesson of this early prohibition failure will largely be ignored. Over the next 200 years, moral crusaders will try to completely eradicate alcohol from the country. But they will only succeed in driving moonshining to new heights. The next major prohibition experiment is ignited in 1851 by a five foot two inch moral crusader nicknamed the Napoleon of Temperance. He is Mayor Neil Dow of Portland, Maine. Neil Dow was a Yankee fury. He was four square, an abolitionist, a prohibitionist. Amebriation was just a part of the world he grew up in, and Dow found deep moral objection in his Yankee Quaker soul to the harm that he felt this drug did to families, to the social fabric of the world he knew. Dow's world is rife with drunkenness. The average person drinks five gallons of alcohol a year, nearly five times as much as an American today. It is one of the greatest periods of alcohol consumption in American history. The crime and violence that accompanies demon rum is epidemic. Spousal abuse is rampant. Drunkenness amongst children, widespread. There were these horrible places where men drank their lives away with complete disregard to the welfare of their spouse and their children. And therefore, the temperance movements really had something to gripe about. In June of 1851, Dow outlaws alcohol in Portland. A few months later, he helps pass a ban for all of Maine. It is the nation's first statewide prohibition law. Now you can imagine that he was not universally popular for that. It took a lot of uh, moral certitude and a certain amount of ego and strong inner core belief to do what he did in a world where alcohol was the social drug of acceptance and available everywhere to every working man. Once again, the attempt at prohibition only fuels illegal liquor as moonshine stills soon litter the hills and alcohol is smuggled over the borders. On June 2nd, 1855, a mob assaults the city hall in Portland. They are after hundreds of cases of liquor stored in the basement for doctors and druggists to prescribe as medicine. This infamous night will end in death. It must have been quite a scene. More than a thousand shouting, angry men bearing torches and battering rams and crashing up against the walls again and again until finally they broke. Neil Dow gave the order to fire. The militia gave two full broadsides onto the crowd. Many were wounded. One man died. Dow saves the liquor and is a hero to temperance advocates. But the bloodshed at the Portland Rum Riot foreshadows the violence the country will witness as the moral crusaders march on. By 1893, five more states join Maine with complete prohibition. By 1913, nine states are dry, including Georgia and North Carolina. 